So I'm Margaret Gam, Head of Special Collections and Archives at the University of Iowa Libraries, and I would like to thank you for joining us today. I would also like to acknowledge that the University of Iowa is located on the historical homelands of over 15 tribal nations, the Omaha Tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska, Meskwaki and Ho-Chunk nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa and we continue to acknowledge them. As an academic institution, it is our responsibility to acknowledge the sovereignty and the traditional territories of these tribal nations, the treaties that were used to remove these tribal nations and the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution since 1847. To help you start your own exploration of these histories of Iowa and its people, we encourage you to take a look at the links provided in the Zoom chat or in the YouTube video description. Today's speakers are Damian Erick, Matt Regan, and Chris Childs. Damian is curator for the John Martin Rear Book Room at the University of Iowa Library's Hardin Library for the Health Sciences, where he has been since 2020. Before working at Hardin, Damian served as the Carver College of Medicine Registrar for nine years, then worked in special collections and archives while earning his master's in library science at the University of Iowa. Matt and Chris are both clinical education librarians at Hardin Library. Chris is liaison to the Colleges of Dentistry and Pharmistry, Pharmacy and to the Departments of Anesthesia and Pathology. Before coming to Hardin, he was the Assistant Director of the Texas Tech Health Sciences Center in Odessa, Texas. Chris got his library degree at the University of North Texas. Matt has liaison responsibilities to several departments in the Carver College of Medicine and University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. He provides reference, instruction, and research support to faculty, staff, and students in his departments, and serves as the technology lead for the Hardin Library. Welcome, Damian, Chris, and Matt. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and uh, kick this off. Um, I'm just going to give a brief uh, overview of the project, and then um, I'm going to show some pictures um, that were taken last year uh, in May. And I'm going to turn this over to Matt, and he's going to talk about the technical components and talk about the creation of the plant records. And then Matt will turn it over to Damien for the bulk of the presentation. So this project was started by a colleague of ours. Uh, her name is Liz Kiskaden. Um, she started this in 2018. Uh, Liz has actually moved on to another library, but while she was at Hardin, she actually served as the Associate Director of the Greater Midwest Region of the National Library of Medicine. She was very enthusiastic about this project and we keep in touch with her periodically. And uh, it's kind of a shame that she's not still a proactive part of the project, but it's uh, nice that she wants to keep in touch and kind of learn about the progress as we go on. Uh, the purpose of this, this um, the whole purpose of this project really is to create an international medicinal herbal garden outside of the new College of Pharmacy building. Um, and visitors, um, when the garden is complete, there'll be signs next to the plants and visitors can connect to an interactive website through the use of a QR code and then get information about all the plants that are growing in the garden. Um, there's going to be a plant record for every plant in the garden that will include images and historical information taken from digitized works from the Hardin Library's John Martin Rare Book Room, and also from contemporary resources from the Hardin Library's collection and from the National Institute of Health Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. So from the beginning, uh, the College of Pharmacy supported the cost of establishing this garden and the plants as part of construction, as part of the construction budget for their new building. Uh, the college worked with uh, University of Iowa facilities to cover the ongoing maintenance of the garden space. One of our team members, uh, Bradley Gilchrist, is the administrative services specialist and building coordinator for the College of Pharmacy. And so he always uh, has been our contact for all the goings on at the College of Pharmacy and has been a fantastic liaison between team members from Hardin and the College of Pharmacy. Uh, another team member, uh, Mark Wiederlichner, is an affiliate associate professor of horticulture and ecology evolution and organ, organ oh, I can't say this, uh, anyway, biology from Iowa State University. Um, we refer to him as the plant guy. His knowledge of plants is just incredibly invaluable. Um, 
when the team started reviewing plants that were identified by the landscaper uh, to determine if they were appropriate for the purpose of the project. Uh, really the criteria was to find plants that had additional value that could also survive in the Iowa climate. Um, so in the fall of 2019, uh, you know, the planting uh, began. And uh, one of the biggest barriers that we've encountered for this project, aside from COVID-19, has been um, there were changes to the original plant list. And these changes were made by the contractor. Uh, the University of Iowa contracted with a company called Confluence on all landscaping and outdoor work. And Confluence in turn contracted um, with Forever Green Nursery on the purchase and installation of all plants in the garden. Uh, Forever Green indicated that they were unable to obtain some of the plants on the list and at first recommended revisions, which would include many plants with no additional value. So Brad got in touch with uh, Krista Scranton, who's the senior construction project manager of the University of Iowa's Facilities Management Landscape Services, who said that all the plants on the original list will either be replanted or planted for the first time and the bill will be sent to Forever Green. So we're very grateful for her uh, to take care of this for us. And this was also convert, confirmed by Dave Brown, who's the University of Iowa's manager for landscape services. So um, when we were constructing the plant records and Matt's gonna go into detail about that, it was a, a source of kind of confusion and frustration because we didn't wanna create plant records for plants that we hadn't originally uh, you know, planned to be in the garden. So there was a lot of back and forth with that. And again, aside from COVID-19, which kind of put all of our all the progress on this uh, project on the back burner. Um, that's been our biggest barrier so far, but uh, it's, it's slowly kind of resolved itself. Um, to add a personal touch to the medicinal uh, herb garden, um, another of our uh, project um, members, uh, Gail Zlotnick, actually took some tiger lily bulbs from her own personal garden last fall and with the help of Brad, found a spot in the garden and, and planted those bulbs. So it kind of adds a nice touch uh, in addition to the plants that were pre-selected. Uh, once the garden is fully planted, the University of Iowa gardeners have volunteered to maintain it on a regular basis. So in addition to the garden being planted, uh, another phase of the project was selecting books from Rare Book Room. And I know Damien's gonna talk about that in more detail. Um, and we had to prioritize them for digitization. And so we worked with Bethany Davis, who's the digital processing coordinator librarian at the main library to, um, to get this process started. And we were very fortunate that several of the titles that were selected had already been digitized in other repositories. So there were only four additional titles that um, you know, needed to be digitized. And so while that was happening, um, Donna Hurst, who was the curator of the John Martin Rare Book Room before she retired, uh, coordinated what we call research days. And that's where you know, all the team members, uh, including uh, Mark who drove down from Iowa State University and Gail as well, uh, would spend a couple hours in, in, in the rare book room. Uh, Donna took all the books that had been selected for the project and she laid them out uh, on, on various tables. And everyone, every member of the team um, got assigned a few books. And I can't remember the exact number of books. I wanna say four to five. And um, there was a sheet of paper for each book each sheet of paper had every single plant listed and we just had to go through the book to see if we could find any historical images or um, any historical information that we could use for, you know, to include in the plant records. And I have to say that um, we we're all very appreciative of Mark's expertise because a lot of times I know I would find images and I would go, Mark, is this the right plant? Uh, Mark, this is a great image. I have no idea if we could use it or Mark, what am I looking at? And um, he was fantastic because uh, when I was creating my plant records, I, when I was looking for images for a plant that I was assigned, if I saw that Mark said, this is an excellent picture or an excellent historical um, piece of information, I would just kind of zero in on that information and use those. Uh, so he, he was fantastic and he saved us a lot of time and effort in getting um, that pertinent information. So that's kind of a brief overview of the project. We're still working on a lot of components. And like I said, Matt's gonna talk about the technical components and um, Damien's gonna you know, talk in, in detail about this, the books that we selected. Um, but what I wanna do, if, if you'll bear with me for a moment, um, I'm going to share my screen. And I want to show you 
uh, some pictures. And these are pictures that Brad took uh, May of last year that really give a nice overview of the garden. So let me, okay. So this is probably my favorite picture right here. Um, I just want to double check. Can, can someone verify they're seeing this picture? Looks good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is an overview of the new, uh, of the medicinal garden. Uh, this is the new College of Public Health building. Um, and this is kind of the main entrance here. Um, so these are the different uh, stands that were used uh, for the plants, but you can see that there are also uh, plants here as well. So this is the bulk of the medicinal garden. Over here is kind of a, a neat little statue that's supposed to represent a, a mortar, and mortar and pestle. I don't know if you can see, but there's some benches here that you can, you know, kind of students and faculty can sit on and relax. So this is kind of a really nice overview uh, of what the garden looks like. And then this is kind of a closer shot. Um, and these are some plants that, that um, have grown. I, unfortunately, I don't know which plants these are. Um, but again, this was taken May of last year. So um, they're, they're coming in pretty well. And this is kind of the same shot. Again, here's the, the new College of Public Health building. Uh, you can see the benches uh, a little, little better in this picture. And this is actually the original College of Public Health building. As you can tell, it's, it's much older. Um, it's still in use, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, but that's kind of a, a view of, of the original building. Do you mean College of Pharmacy? or College of Pharmacy, sorry. I used to be the, the liaison to College of Public Health and I still, you know, get, get those two mixed up. And so this is just the last picture, kind of more of a um, picture taken closer to the ground. These are just all various plants that have been growing. Uh, and again, these were taken of May of last year. So I went, um, I think, two or three days ago to look to see if any, anything had been coming up. And really the only thing that had, had really been uh, coming up were uh, chives. So I thought I'd stick with these pictures. You get a little bit more variety, a little bit more green. And that's, uh, those are all the pictures there. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And I will turn this over to Matt. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so as Chris has mentioned, um, a whole lot of work has gone into the physical construction of the garden and now it is complete. We have plants on the ground. We have a wonderful place where people can visit. And we've also done all of this work to create records for each one of these plants. We've done research in the original texts in the rare book room, uh, digitizations have been done and um, we've also done quite a bit of research in databases that we have available at Hardin, including PubMed and, and doing searches. Um, and additionally in databases that deal specifically in natural medicines um, and compiled all this information together. So at this point, we have a garden and we have all this information. And the question is, how do we get this information to the users, to the people who are wandering around in the garden? And really the answer to that question is a technological one. So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today. We have been very fortunate, in addition to all the partnerships that Chris mentioned and everyone on, on the team, we've also been so fortunate as to be able to partner with the uh, Digital Scholarship and Publishing Studio, which is housed at Maine Library, and they've agreed to help us build out a website for this project. Uh, and we're currently in the process of creating that website but we do have a good chunk of it completed and I'll be able to show you a little bit of that in a bit. However, I just want to take a moment to thank the studio for their contributions uh, because a few of the things that they bring to this project is a much more professional look to the digital presence for this project um, and an optimized platform that will look best on mobile phones which is really how this project is designed to be viewed. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that reason is uh, a little bit later. Um, as Chris mentioned, COVID has slowed down many things as well as the derecho. Uh, 
so just like the plants had some trouble getting up uh, out of the ground, uh, we also had some problems getting the website off the ground. Uh, however, we are now in the process where we have a website mostly built and we have begun to be able to enter records into that website. Uh, it's not fully done and it's not publicly viewable, but we are at a point now where I can start sharing with you some of the things that we've been working on. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So this is what one record out of the website will look like. As I mentioned, the studio was able to help us create a, uh, a logo for this project for the Roots of Medicine. And this is just a record for May Apple. So we have illustrations out of some of the books that have been digitized out of the rare book room. Uh, in each record, we'll have a description of where that, what that book is uh, and links back to the John Martin Rare Book Room. We'll have aggregates of information about the plant itself, as well as some of the ways that it's been used medicinally, both currently and historically. And then a specific highlight on the historic use of that particular plant, including snippets of the historic books that um, that mentioned the medicinal uses of the plant and sometimes a translation of what that means. Uh, now, some of these books like this are in English and that makes this a whole lot easier. Some of these uh, were, are in German or in Latin or very early English and can be a little bit difficult to read. Uh, I know that some of the ones I have have the Fs as Ss um, and strange characters. So we do have some translations available and again, this will all be uh, quoted for where it's coming from and linked back to the John Martin Rare Book Room. Now, in addition to supplying our users with information on, just general information on how a plant has been used, what it looks like and what its range is, we also have, want to connect them with the most current research on that particular plant. One of the nice things that this installation has allowed us to do is to bring in feeds from PubMed. Now, this is something we had a little bit of trouble with. In addition to all the other changes during the course of this project, we also had a complete redesign of PubMed happen. And originally we were planning to bring in this, what's called an RSS feed into the site. And for a, a long part of this project, that functionality left PubMed and we didn't have it available. Luckily within the last uh, little while, it's come back and, and now we're able to create this again. So I'm actually going to take this opportunity to show you a little bit about how we do this. As part of our research, each of us created a search, a PubMed search specifically for a plant uh, and its medicinal uses. And all we needed to do was to take that search and to plug it into PubMed. So this is an example search that I have for that for Valerian. And what's nice about this is if I just click search, it will come up with results. A particular one has 375. Now, I definitely don't want that many results to appear on my website. That would be a little overwhelming, but I can create this RSS feed and I can give it a new name and I can tell it how many items I want to be displayed. So if I left it at the default, there would be 15 different articles out of the search displayed on the website. Instead, I'm just gonna change it to five, create RSS, and now I have a link. And what's nice about the, uh, the installation that we have is I can just take this link, put it into a particular um, functionality within that site, and it automatically pulls in all of these records. What's nice about this is that these are now linked back to PubMed. So if a user is on this page and they click on the title, it will take them directly into PubMed. It will take them into the article. And if they're on campus, which they probably will be because they're gonna be at the garden, there should also be links on the right-hand side here where they can get to the full text of that article as well. So hopefully this will help connect people with not only the historicity of these plans, but also with current medical research as well. 
Uh, and then I kind of just want to point out that we're all librarians. So obviously we cite our references. And at the end of each one of these records, there is going to be a, a reference list. So that's where we're at now. Um, we currently have about 15% of our records included in the site, um, but we've been working with the studio and we have a plan in place to rapidly be able to put the remainder of the records into the site pretty quickly. Uh, I think our estimate is sometime late this spring, early summer at the very latest, we should have all of the records in the site and the site should be completed. And at that point, our question is, well, now we have this digital presence, how do we get the users in the garden to this website? Uh, that answer is also a technological one. So the answer is, as Chris mentioned, uh, custom plant tags. Now I'm showing this site for a couple of reasons. One, just to give you a sense of what these are, I think we've all probably been into an arboretum uh, or a a garden that has particular signs that say what the plants are. We've ordered one of these for each one of our plants that not only has uh, the common and scientific name for the plant in question, it's got our logo for the Roots of Medicine project, and it also has a QR code on it. So for those of you who aren't familiar with what QR codes are, this tag gives a little bit of an example. And it's essentially a graphic representation of a URL or a link. So that if a user is, or if a visitor to the garden uh, has their phone with them, they can open up their camera, point it at the tag, and it should take them directly to one of our records. Now, I'm going to attempt a little experiment here because I have one of these record, one of these with us. So if you want to, you can uh, put it on speaker view, get a nice big view of my face. And I have a couple of these tags here and I'd like for you all to, to test them out. So if you have your phone with you, go ahead and get it out and just turn on the camera. And I am just going to hold this up nice and close. And that points your camera at that square and you should get something that pops up that will take you to the page. I see Damien's phone out. He's been able to use his camera to, to access it. And I'm just gonna hold it up here for a couple more seconds. Margaret Gam says success. Fantastic. So we have one of these tags for each one of the plants in the garden. There will be about 40 of them and they will stand on one foot stakes next to the plants and anyone who is wandering through will be able to pull out their phone, point it at the tag, and then immediately have a wealth of information at their fingertips. Uh, so that's really the technological piece of this. Um, and I'm gonna pass it on to Damien for a little bit more of the, the historic piece of this project. All right, thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks, Chris. I am going to share my screen real quick. Well, first of all, um, thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Liz, for uh, having us here tonight. Um, you know, for me personally, this is great to be back, even if it's not in person. Uh, it's great to be back in Special Collections. Um, uh, just a little bit about uh, us over here before we get started. So uh, I'm coming to you live from the uh, John Martin Rare Book Room and uh, we're housed in the Hardin Library for the Health Sciences. Um, we were founded uh, thanks to a generous donation of both a, uh, a significant collection, but also um, an endowment and funds for the room from Dr. John Martin. Um, and uh, currently we sit at about 6,500 volumes. Um, that includes about 40 Incunabula or um, early printed books. Um, when I joined here last summer, I was super excited to hear about this uh, particular project and the fact that I'd be able to join in, uh, even if it's only at the tail end of the project, um, I've still got to be involved. And uh, honestly, I, I owe uh, a huge debt uh, to Donna Hurst, who, um, as uh, Matt and Chris have mentioned, uh, uh, did a, a great deal of work to get the historical piece up and running and the, and the research going on this. Um, 
But I'm also excited to be here tonight and uh, share with you uh, at least a brief history of herbal medicine and uh, some of the sources that we used for this uh, particular project from the rare book room. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, everyone um, keeps getting their vaccinations and the world opens up a little bit here in the next year. Uh, it'd be great to see all of you here in person so that you can take a look at uh, these particular resources yourself. Um, so uh, this is John Martin Rare Book Room, or at least one glimpse from one angle. Um, and uh, we're gonna start with ancient Western herbal medicine. And of course, uh, this goes back a long ways, pre-written history, a um, lot of oral tradition that would have eventually been written down. Uh, we know of uh, some of the big names, so like Hippocrates, uh, Galen, Pliny, um, Scorides, and I'm going to apologize right now for anyone um, who uh, is a language aficionado. I'm going to uh, really murder some of these names tonight, and I apologize. I've, I've tried to find some uh, really good pronunciation guides for some of these names, and uh, uh, all I can say is there's a lot of conflicting information out there. So I'm going to go with Discordes. Um, If there's a better pronunciation, please do let me know. Um, but Discordes really is the big name in this list, um, very influential throughout the Middle Ages, um, along with the others as well, but Discordes in particular, and especially once we get to the uh, Renaissance, uh, his name pops back up, and we'll go into him in a little bit more uh, detail. So um, again, these would have been, um, these writings would have been based on uh, historical oral tradition. Um, they may have been well-known. Uh, you know, well-known information, or um, could have been family secrets that have been passed down from family member to family member. If you're a family of healers, um, you're trying to protect your, your trade secrets. Um, and uh, often it would have uh, gone beyond just uh, plants. It would have included um, other materials in nature. So um, anything that could have been combined to create uh, medicine or something to help heal. Um, milk and honey is a famous example. Um, but also salt pops up, even gems uh, pop up. And collectively, this would have been known as materia medica. That's a term maybe some of you are familiar with. Um, and uh, Discorides, who I mentioned before, uh, he was uh, born in around somewhere we would call Turkey now. Um, and he actually created a work called materia medica. And again, this is a body of, of collected knowledge about healing properties um, from material in the environment. And uh, he was writing in the first century AD, and he really was the, the, the big hitter um, from this group. And uh, he uh, was a surgeon for the Roman armies during the time of Nero. And this provided him with great opportunity to uh, travel and, and study uh, a lot of the features and, and distribution and medicinal properties of um, many of the, of the plants and minerals uh, in the area. And so he created uh, really, um, really nice descriptions for about 600 plants. Um, and again, he, he would have been influenced by earlier written works as well, but those haven't survived. We see them referenced elsewhere, but those haven't survived. So his is really the, the, um, the big one. And um, his arrangement wasn't necessarily what you would call systematic. Um, but he had a, an entry for each plant name, uh, maybe a few synonyms in different languages. Uh, there would have been a description for the plant and where it could have been found, uh, and then how the plant could have been prepared in some sort of remedy. Um, and his work would have uh, gone on to heavily influence uh, both Western and, and Arab herbal medicine. Uh, and then over time, uh, during the Middle Ages, it would have been expanded uh, as that information spread and uh, local traditions would have been added onto this. And we, we, we can really see the effects of that in uh, the illustrations for particular works. Um, illustrations over the Middle, Middle Ages tended to be copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. And you also start to see this layering of local lore and mythology and traditions. And so by the time you get to something like uh, Medicini Pharmacia in the 13th century, this is a, a, an image from a facsimile we have here. Um, you see a mandrake plant, a, an image of a mandrake plant. And you can see um, that's not very helpful uh, for identifying an actual mandrake plant. And if that is actually what a mandrake plant looks like, that is very frightening. Equally frightening, you can see the entry from uh, Tractatus de Urbis uh, from the uh, early 15th century, 
again, uh, uh, I'm using mandrake plants here. Mandrake plants show up a lot. Um, they also come in male and female varieties. Uh, so I'm sort of using that as a, as a through line through um, all the resources I'm gonna show you. So you see a, a female mandrake plant depicted on the left and a male depicted on the right. Um, and uh, you can tell they, they don't really correspond to um, the actual plant. They're highly stylized um, and they really don't help you with identifying the plant. Um, so when we move from the manuscript tradition to the printed tradition, uh, much like other books, that manuscript tradition gets carried over into the early printed books that we see, um, especially, uh, you know, most of the herbals that came out prior to 1500, you see this. Um, these early printed works would have been combinations of anonymous herbal uh, manuscripts that were created during the Middle Ages. They themselves would have been copies and, and amalgamations of different works. So sources such as uh, Discordes, again, Pliny, Hippocrates, Galen, um, they would have been combined. Uh, occasionally, would, they would have been copied word for word, but um, not always. Um, they would have been, you know, meshed together in different ways. Um, printers of early herbals essentially just had co collections of these manuscripts about, and they would commission other folks to come in and then write new herbals um, without actually doing any research uh, on the plants or the medicine behind them. Um, and then what you see here is uh, Conrad von Megenberg's Das Puch der Natur, or Book of Nature from 1475. And this is believed to be the first uh, with um, known woodcuts for botanical illustrations. So the first time you see woodcuts with uh, plants. Um, but uh, again, it was rare to have original drawings in herbals before the 16th century. So um, you would have seen like, these copies of copies. And um, especially prior to 1530, they were nearly useless for plant identification. Um, you get really these rough outlines of plants, um, really reduced to, to these basic features um, or stylized, like what you see here. Again, this is a female mandrake plant depicted here. Uh, this is not what mandrake plants look like, which we will see shortly, uh, better illustrations um, that actually help you identify the plant. But these books, uh, um, you know, these early books were really meant to be reference books for folks who had little to no access to physicians. So um, they weren't really for the medical community. Um, it was, so it was more based in the world of folk medicine um, and the, the printing of books helped reduce the price. So it made them more accessible, um, made the information more widely available. Same thing um, being printed in vernacular languages instead of just Latin or Greek. Um, so this information was trying to reach a, a wider audience. So once we get to the Renaissance herbal, uh, we start to see this rejection of the traditional, uh, traditional understandings and, and beliefs, and a drive to revisit the ancients, to uh, reevaluate what the ancients uh, actually wrote, um, and to uh, really push against, to really focus on what's observable, and to push against um, just accepting whatever has come before. And the first systematic attempt we see at that is uh, Otto Brunfels, who was a, a German physician. He published uh, Herbarum Vive Icones in 1530. And you can see an example of that from the Metropolitan Museum of Art here. Um, and uh, what he managed to do was create really accurate drawings. So these are woodcuts of the plants. <clears throat> so actually observing the plants themselves and making these woodcuts based off of the, the plants. And they're trying to make them life-size um, and as accurate as possible. Um, and you know, at the same time, this is a critique of uh, everything that has come before. And this emphasis on accuracy um, you, you see um, going forward. So especially in folks like um, Leonard Fuchs, um, Hieronymus Bach, uh, the three of those, Brunfels, Bach, and, and Fuchs, are um, considered the fathers of German herbalism. And uh, really, Fuchs, which who we'll see here in just a second, um, his work really influenced folks to um, focus on the accuracy of um, the depiction of the plants, uh, as well as the text. However, the text for Brunfels here um, really wasn't that great. Um, and uh, the illustrations were, were wonderful. Um, but the text um, wasn't great if you were going out and trying to identify plants or use them in some way. Um, they 
his text didn't really make a distinction for localities. So it was just, um, you know, it was assumed whatever plants were in this book, they grew everywhere and they grew the same way. So moving on to Leonard Fuchs, um, he was uh, also a German physician and uh, he was a practicing pharmacologist, a, uh, a fervid Hippocrates and uh, a prodigious writer. Um, the most famous of which is uh, what you see here, De Historia Stirpium from 1542. Uh, and this is traditionally regarded as the first botanical work in which both the text and the illustrations uh, are actually based on personal observation uh, rather than just copying down information. So he described 400 German plants as well as uh, over 100 foreign ones. So you also start to see some of uh, regional description of plants rather than just assuming everything grows everywhere. Uh, and he really did set the standard for uh, plant descriptions, not only just the imagery, but also the description of the plants as well. He went on to uh, especially influence the uh, Flemish uh, fathers of, of uh, herbalism. So that'd be um, the Doans, Lobel, and uh, Clusius. And uh, they went on to um, really focus on regional plants, uh, um, again, sort of taking, taking up the torch from Fuchs and um, trying to, again, move beyond just the common assumption, plants grow everywhere. Uh, and also, importantly, um, he included images, illustrations of the artists who helped make the book. So you have the uh, artist who took, uh, who created the images from the plants themselves, the artist who transferred them to the woodblocks, and then the woodblock sculptor himself. Uh, and uh, this also gives us a sense of the relative importance of these particular positions. You can see the sculptor uh, got uh, his own part of the page, and so uh, more than likely was a more esteemed uh, profession. Um, and you can also see uh, Fuchs's um, uh, mandrake there, and it's actually starting to look uh, a lot more like an actual plant. So um, Discorides was first printed, uh, so going back to the original text, was first printed in 1529. Um, and then there were lots and lots of editions after that. I think 1598 is considered uh, the standard one. But in the meantime, uh, Pietro Mattioli from Italy uh, created his commentaries on Discorides in 1544, this one in, in his native Italian. Uh, however, there were at least uh, 36 editions, um, many, many different languages. Uh, and his goal was he tried to identify as conclusively as possible the plants that were described in Discordia. So he was going back to the original text and um, uh, trying to figure out what plants Discordia was actually talking about. Uh, so Mattioli himself was uh, a doctor and a naturalist. Um, he, uh, interestingly enough, he described the first case of cat allergy that we know of. Um, a, uh, he was a careful student of botany and uh, in addition to identifying the um, original plants to Discordia, he actually added about 100 of his own um, that he uh, observed. And uh, what was really interesting about that is that not all of them have medicinal properties. So um, it marked this transition period from uh, only focusing on plants in a medicinal sense to really thinking about plants uh, in their own right uh, for their own reasons. Um, rather than only in a medicinal con context. So you're starting to see, um, uh, you know, botany as a field uh, start to develop. Uh, in addition, the woodcuts, um, which are not in this first edition. So um, there are some really nice uh, illustrated initials, but there aren't uh, any plant um, illustrations in here. Um, they're uh, very high standard and uh, they really did allow for recognition of the plant, even if the text was obscure. And we can start to see that in this Latin uh, translation from 1554. And again, I've got the mandrake plants here and uh, these woodcuts are, are pretty amazing. Um, and uh, not only that, but his, his translations. So Mattioli himself was kind of a big name already. Um, he was a big name as a doctor. And, um, but this really, uh, these works, his translations uh, really um, made him even a, a bigger name, and these works were, were huge at this time. Um, so his translations uh, were very popular, uh, very well received. Um, it, part of it was his reputation, like I said, part of it was uh, his ability to translate into the vernacular, 
um, but also his extensive commentaries on the entries. These were all factors in uh, the very rapid and, and wide acceptance of his translations. Uh, notable also were, um, I mean, his acceptance of classical writers as authoritative um, and addition of uh, illustrations to later works such as this one, uh, including a German edition that we have from 1626. Uh, and you can see this one has been uh, heavily painted. And uh, the first German edition was actually published in 1562. Uh, and then it just kept going. It was published uh, well into the 18th century. So this is a, a, an edition from 1626. So going back to the Dones, uh, again, Flemish doctor, um, he went on to study medicine at uh, different places in France, Italy, Germany, but eventually made it back uh, to his hometown and where he was made um, town physician. And in 1554, he published quite a book. A, uh, it was a national herbarium devoted to uh, species indigenous to the Flemish provinces. So again, you're, you're talking about the more of a, a local uh, regional influence there. And uh, really the merit of uh, this particular book was uh, rather than proceeding by uh, alphabetical order as, as Fuchs had done through the plants, uh, he tried to group them according to their properties, uh, which was uh, a first. And um, it was illustrated with more than 850 quarter paged woodcuts uh, of plants in the text, which you can see the mandrake plant there. Um, and actually what you're seeing here is the English translation of a French translation by uh, the other, one of the other Flemish doctors at the time, Clusius. Um, so in 1578, this was an, an English translation that came out. Um, and uh, we were pretty excited because when we got this copy, there were uh, botanical specimens interleaved in the pages. And so those have been uh, removed and encapsulated and we keep them uh, with the book now, which is, that, was, that was pretty exciting to find those in there. And so for those of you who are uh, avid readers of the Friends of the John Martin Rare Book Room newsletter, which I'm sure there are many, uh, you will definitely notice this book from last month. Uh, this is Adam Lonecker or Lonitzer's uh, work, Kreuterbuch from 1587. Uh, Lonecker was a, a doctor and a proofreader for his father-in-law who just happened to be a printer. And uh, this was sort of at the, the beginning of his career and um, he loved to write on uh, math and uh, botany and medicine, of course. Um, and so eventually uh, his uh, father-in-law had him write this book. Uh, and this text covers uh, three parts of what would have known as the, the natural world at that point. And uh, it really tries to find a very wide audience. It's trying to um, uh, direct its remarks to both uh, physicians and apothecaries. And I'll, I'll get into those distinctions a little bit, and then uh, both, uh, and then um, just regular households as well. So a very wide audience for this particular book. Um, but the emphasis is on, on how to use um, parts from the animal as well as plants and, and minerals, things from the environment to produce medicinal, gastronomical, or other household preparations. He's got a really big section in here on, on distillation. Um, and he also provides us one of the early descriptions of local German flora. And uh, he's also one of the first to distinguish deciduous trees from conifers. Um, and you can see this is another example of painted illustrations. And this would have, this would have added cost. Uh, some printers would have had them pre-painted. Uh, most would have been unpainted and they would have been sold that way. And then, uh, you know, whoever bought the book, uh, however they had the book bound, whether it was pre-bound or whether they, you know, went to their own binder, um, they would have also decided if they wanted to have it painted, but definitely the making of the illustrations um, at this time, they would have kept them fairly you know, broad outline because the assumption was if somebody was buying this, there's a good chance they would go out and, and have it painted. Uh, so Gerard uh, created the herbal in 1597. You see the 1633 edition here, the second edition. Um, and this was meant to be uh, really the first major English uh, herbal. And uh, it was really the most influential English herbal for years and years and years. This was another publisher-led printing. So, um, you know, the, the, the printer wanted to have this done. 
and uh, ended up renting wood blocks from another printer in Germany. And in fact, kept them for many, 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 many years beyond when they were supposed to, even though the uh, printer kept asking for them back. Because of course, um, it was pretty common to, to share um, uh, images across books, but they also wanted to print their own herbals again. And so they wanted the, the blocks back. Um, so this printer went out and hired an author who just happened to die before they could finish the book. So Gerard was eventually hired. And then a Lobel, who I mentioned before, who was a Flemish uh, doctor and herbalist, was hired for the editing and, and correcting. So Gerard was a barber surgeon. Uh, so three of the big medical groups at the time were barber surgeons, apothecaries, and physicians. And they all approached medicine in different ways. And, and you can kind of think of them as, as street gangs at this time, because they all, um, they all uh, tried to sort of carve out their territory and, and protect their territory. Um, and so Gerard was a barber surgeon. He was also a botanist and, and an herbalist. And um, uh, he actually maintained a very large uh, herbal garden in London where he lived, um, but he's best known uh, for the almost 1500 uh, pages of, of the illustrated herbal here, which first printed in 1597. Um, and uh, again, it was very widely circulated uh, in the 17th century. But what you see here is the second edition and what's really interesting about the second edition is that the uh, widow and, and other family members of the original printer caught wind that another English herbalist, um, Parkinson, was going to um, create uh, something to rival Gerard's. And so they scrambled to find somebody who would um, create an updated edition of the herbal. And so they hired Thomas Johnson, who was a well-known apothecary. In, in London and a botanist. And uh, he was hired, but he was told he had to, he had to complete this work in a year, which he did, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, and uh, it, um, it really, again, became the, the standard along with Parkinson's book uh, for English herbal books. Um, and uh, an interesting twist to this is that uh, Johnson being an apothecary, again, one of those street gangs, uh, he was very interested in this project, and you can see some of this reflected in his uh, sort of um, historical uh, reminiscences uh, in the start of the book. Um, he treats it as a chance to really take Gerard down a notch, uh, because Gerard, again, is, is a barber surgeon. Uh, and you, you see some of this through, uh, throughout other books as well. Um, but this new edition ended up with uh, almost 2,800 woodblock prints. Um, again, these were borrowed from another printer um, and uh, really became even bigger than the, the original edition. Um, so during this time, uh, standards for plant description, so the actual description of the plants, um, uh, became clearer, there was more detail. Um, you started to see maybe an inkling of standardized vocabulary. Some location information was being added. Um, there were still lots of synonyms. Uh, though, and not necessarily genus or species or any kind of variety distinctions. Um, plants were classified in different ways in these books. So you might have uh, plants classified by medical properties or morphological, how they might be used, etym etymological. Um, but really, once you get to, to Fuchs, um, that really is the standard for the time. And uh, the images and the text were taken from observation. And so that really became the, the method past that point. Uh, you also started to see um, smaller books, so octavos. Uh, this was again, to try and reach wider audiences. This, this became a compromise. You're trying to reach more folks, um, but the images couldn't be life-size anymore. Uh, so it becomes a little harder to use um, because the best detail would be in the, in the larger images. You also saw some of the same issues of, of plagiarism, competition, uh, that you saw in other uh, areas of, of printing in the 16th, 17th centuries, uh, especially um, the printer for Brunfels and the printer for Lonitzer. Um, they were both kind of notorious, especially um, the, the printer for, for Lonecker, whose name was Egenolf. Um, he was really well known as uh, someone who would take other people's stuff without crediting them. Um, and again, copying of illustrations was very standard. And in fact, uh, you can find um, you can find the same illustrations just reversed in other books because they would have, uh, you know, copied the images and then um, 
go to print them and they would have been reversed then uh, when they went to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, it also shouldn't be assumed that this was really good information for the time, but it shouldn't be assumed that this information was really accurate or great. <laughs> um, it was the best they had at the time uh, and, uh, and could be very useful, but it wouldn't necessarily be what we would consider very useful. And, and we found this out, um, or you know, Matt and Chris and the others found this out as they were doing their research. Um, you might have a plant labeled in a particular way or described in a particular way, but um, it wasn't actually the species or the specific plant that, that they were looking for. So, um, but again, for the time, these were the, the gold standard. Over time, however, uh, herbals, specifically herbals, began to um, take on more of the occult and uh, really strayed again from uh, mostly useful plant and, and medical descriptions. And um, that's where we come to someone like uh, Nicholas Culpepper, who sort of uh, became a, a brand name. Uh, so he was uh, a, a doctor. He had extensive medical background from a reading. He served a couple of apprenticeships with apothecaries. Um, and he started out as a physician astrologer, which really wasn't um, all that uh, unheard of at the time. And uh, he you know, had a very large practice. He gathered a lot of fame for himself. Um, you know, we, we would consider his works, we would consider him a quack and his works to be, um, you know, not very sound scientifically, but, um, he also was a prolific translator. So he translated a lot of notable scientific works, um, into, uh, English and other languages, uh, authors such as Galen, um, Sinner, Riolan, Glisson, um, and, uh, again, going back to that sort of turf war between all of these groups, uh, the physicians were uh, very shocked and angered when he went and published an English translation of the uh, Latin pharmacopoeia. Uh, and uh, again, these were trade secrets and by keeping it in Latin, it restricted the number of people who, who could actually have access to this information. But he went and translated it all into English and made it uh, much more widely available to, the, uh, to folks who spoke English, read English. Um, and uh, he did that again with uh, uh, one or two other books as well, um, trying to knock down those walls and create more access and create a name for himself. Uh, what you see here is an edition from 1789. So again, well after his death, um, you know, people took up his name uh, and uh, began to uh, print uh, updated editions of his work. Um, very nice, uh, very small, uh, but very lovely uh, printed images of plants in the books, but the uh, plant descriptions themselves were uh, uh, definitely not very helpful. Um, I will also say, um, I, will, I will end there uh, because I know we're running out of time. We don't have time for questions, but I'll also say that we have several uh, editions of um, late modern um, uh, medical botany books. So these would have evolved more into what, uh, you know, starting to look more what we think of when we think of uh, botany books, so more systematic study of plants and their descriptions. Um, and we also use those as uh, part of this project. So I will stop there and we can take some questions.